All right. Well, this is. Um, thanks for being here. <laughs> Genuinely. All right. Okay. Well, um, I mean, we can talk about this. We can, um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll look at random forests and boosting and, um, um, we'll go from there. So again, bonus content. All right. So on Wednesdays, we talked about decision trees and we said, you know, you do these kind of binary splits. And you, the decision tree just tries to maximize how much improvement you get in the residual sum of squares after, you know, because you only get to make one prediction um, for each like final bucket. So if you have a tree with three le levels, each with two, you'll have eight final buckets, which means you can only predict eight unique values. Okay. Um, so that's so the predictive performance of a decision tree is not great because if you're limited to just predicting eight unique values and you segment the population into eight groups, that's that's about it. Okay. Um, on the other hand, decision trees they are super easy to understand, very easy to explain to somebody who's not familiar with statistics or machine learning um, uh, so that's that's a really nice thing and you can kind of illustrate that but um, it's predictive performance just isn't that great okay so we we have a couple um, methods for improving the performance of a decision tree okay and one of them is bagging now we don't generally use bagging alone because bagging by itself produces like trees that are like way too similar but uh, the idea with bagging is you resample your data and so you get kind of just like your pop your sample but just slightly modified it's kind of like you know if I just I don't know is mixed everything up again I'm gonna get just a slightly different version of this thing and then you fit a decision tree to this slightly different sample okay and so you'll get a slightly different tree right so you have your original tree then you have this resampled data and you get a slightly different tree you do it again you get you get a bunch of these just slightly different trees and the idea here now is um, you take your test case and you feed it into all of the trees and all of the trees might make slightly different predictions so it's kind of like um, I don't know <laughs> when, when you buy clothing right certain depending on the company that manufactures the clothing like for one company you might be a medium and then another company might be a large or something like that right and so it's just kind of like each of these things, each tree is just slightly different. And so the observation might have gone down this path in this tree and it ended up over here. And then the observation might have gone down this path on this tree and ended up over here. And so at the end of the day, you kind of take the average of all of these things and you say, yeah, overall, like I'm probably something between a medium and a large, right? Whereas someone else, um, they might most of the things are mediums but then some of them they're classified in small and they, they might be somewhere in between medium and small okay and so you get uh, just a little bit more unique values because you're uh, you're averaging out the uh, the different kind of trees and things so uh, for this I've done like an example of manual bagging uh, again it's kind of silly so the original data frame we had x is one two three four five and my y values are one one three seven eight and here I sample with replacement which is what bootstrapping is and so my x instead of getting one two three four five I get two three four and I end up sampling the observation at four twice two three four four five okay and when I run um, a decision tree there 
it says split it at three and a half, and if it's less than three and a half, okay, so you'll predict two, and if it's greater than three and a half, you're going to predict uh, 7.33, okay. Um, if I resample it again this time, instead of one, two, three, four, five, I got one, three, three, four, five, and so we'll probably split between three and four again at three and a half, and if it's less than three and a half, we'll predict uh, 331 uh, divided by three, what's that, 2.33 or something, yeah, 2.33, and if it's greater than three and a half, we'll predict seven and a half. And then here, when I resampled, kind of by coincidence, I got one, 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 and four and four, okay, and instead of one, two, three, four, five. Sometimes that happens when you resample, you just end up getting a whole bunch of the same observation. So here we're gonna split between one and four, which is at two and a half, and then if it's less than two and a half, we predict a one, and if it's greater than two and a half, we predict a seven. So that's just kind of coincidental. And so if we get a new observation at number four, and we say make a prediction, when you feed it through the first tree, it predicts 7.33. If you feed number four through the second tree, it predicts 7.5. And you predict number four through the last tree, you get 7.0, okay? And so the average of all of these things is 7.278. And that's, that's what you get when you do bagging, okay? But again, so we don't generally do bagging all by itself because um, it is, <laughs> it, the trees all end up looking like too similar to each other. Cause you're, all, cause the only thing you're really doing is you're just resampling your data and you're just tweaking it uh, ever so, so slightly. So you get these trees that are kind of overly correlated um, and you end up overfitting any kind of unusual features that are in your training data set and not really present in the, um, in the, uh, I don't know, general population. Uh, and then another issue uh, with bagging alone is that um, if you have one variable, a predictor variable that is uh, highly correlated with the response, okay, that predictor is so good, it ends up being, um, used like probably as the primary split in every single tree like that first split is going to be like the same variable the same kind of it's like the same opening move because it's it's just too good right and uh and most of the time that's fine but you might get um you might be in a situation where that one variable isn't so great and or doesn't do a good job predicting or that initial split um, you know if you use the same kind of opening move every single time then I guess you're like vulnerable to like uh, something that doesn't kind of fit your traditional um, paradigm and so the kind of uh, technique to combat this is to use random forest Okay, and with the random forest, we um, randomly select the variables that we can use when, um, when splitting the data. Okay, so uh, rather than looking at all of the variables and saying, okay, let's consider which split is going to be uh, produce kind of the best improvement in residual sum of squares, you are now limited. It's like I'm tying one hand behind your back and I'm saying you're limited just to these five variables. Okay, so out of the data set of, of uh, I don't know, 20 variables or something, you're just, um, you're limited to just a small selection. Okay, and so each of these individual trees are this are that's kind of like impaired. Like none of the trees by themselves are good because we've like said you have to learn how to <laughs> you have to learn how to make predictions, um, you know, with one hand tied behind your back. Okay. However, all of these trees are going to be kind of highly diverse, and um, and at the end you're going to be like averaging all of them. You're going to aggregate all of them. Okay. 
so I, I put this silly analogy here, right? And it's kind of like you're, you're trying to assemble a team of superheroes for, for a mission or something, okay? Um, or what did I say? I don't know. Like you're, you're trying to recruit something for a heist, someone for a heist. And if you all recruit like five of the same person, right? Like if, if your Justice League is all five Supermans, okay? Um, you know, one kryptonite bomb would just destroy the whole thing. You need you need some kind of diversity in in your thing to be to be effective, right? And so that's why it's it's like such a trope. But anytime there's like a movie with a heist or a crew or something, it's like we have the whatever this guy, you know, the the muscle and the the driver and the uh, you know the disguise expert or whatever right and you have like each of these kind of different characters and um and they do these things i put um uh here i put if everyone selected has sight then it's very likely that everyone depends heavily using that vision to navigate and sight is considered one of your most important se uh, senses okay but if you include like <laughs> uh daredevil i don't know are there other blind superheroes that don't use you would think the batman would not have sight and he would like <laughs> but um uh but okay but yeah like if you were on like some kind of superhero team or something and you have a, a blind superhero then um if you're in uh, this kind of new situation where vision is not as helpful like a dark cave then you know having a blind person um, blind superhero on your team would be very useful. I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think. Are there other? Well, anyway. So, so that's kind of the idea behind <laughs> random forest. Is uh, rather than allowing every single tree to be as optimal as it can be on its own, you're going to have a whole bunch of these kind of not great trees. Okay, individually, the trees in your random forest. Are going to perform poorly because you've impaired them in that they're only you know for this tree you say you're only allowed to consider these kind of five variables and do do the best you can with those five variables and so individually each of these trees are poor but then you average them all and you get something kind of good all right because if if you didn't use the random forest then probably almost all of your trees will end up being very similar to each other, okay? And all the trees might use the same four variables, okay? Um, but with the random forest, because you've kind of impaired the tree, you're gonna, it's gonna end up using like a whole bunch of different variables. And so therefore, when a new observation comes in, it's gonna be looking at like all 50 variables um, and, uh, and average them that way. And so you end up getting better performance that way. So the random forest works kind of like this. You do a bootstrap resample of the training data. And then when fitting a tree, you choose only a subset, a random subset of the predictor variables. Uh, you fit a whole bunch of these trees. And then when it comes time to make a prediction, you run that prediction, that new observation through all of the different trees that you have and then you take the average of all of their predictions, or if it's classification, you have them uh, vote uh, for all of these things. So this is kind of, I think this picture I took from Wikipedia. And so you have here, we have three different, I guess, or N different trees in our forest. So it, again, leaning heavily on the uh, <laughs> tree analogy, when you have a whole bunch of trees, that's a forest, and so this, this new instance goes through this tree and it predicts this output. This instance goes through this tree and it predicts this output. This one goes through this tree and it predicts this output. And uh, if it's classification, you know, they all kind of, you do a majority vote of the different predictions. If it's regression, you get numeric predictions and you do take an average. And, uh, and that's how a uh, random forest might work, okay? Um, random forest is pretty, uh, it's easily imp implemented in R. You have a couple nice packages. Uh, one package is the random forest package, and, and that works well. 
Uh, a newer package that also works is called Ranger. Uh, and I guess that's kind of like the idea of having a forest ranger um, to, to navigate the forest, I guess, or whatever. Okay, uh, this is, uh, we'll take a look at this air quality data set. And I guess we're trying to predict this variable ozone based on all of the other remaining variables. Okay, and, um, and this will create our ozone rain and forest. And you just let it run. Uh, M try says try out three variables at any kind of uh, random selection of three variables. And it does this and it creates 500 trees in our forest. And it says uh, it explains 72% of our variation. So um, here is just kind of like one observation. Um, I don't know, these are the different. <laughs> different values and I have no idea what these are um, and it predicted 35.95 and the true value was 41 so we have a little bit of error there okay um, and that's that's kind of how uh, you can execute random forest um, in 101 C I like to use tidy models with R and there is a free textbook and this is the textbook that we will use in, um, in my 101C class, Tidy Modeling with R. And they cover the use of, say, random forests or just a whole bunch of different, um, uh, different, kinds, of, uh, different kinds of models. And uh, let's see, I've got, these are all linear regression models, I don't know. Uh, different things out there, but um, uh, random forest is, uh, is one of these things, okay? Um, related, another tree-related method is boosting, okay? And so um, before large language models came on the scene and kind of took up all of the discussion of machine learning and AI, there was, uh, as far as having models predict values and things like that, um, a very kind of popular set of models was uh, through XGBoost. I don't know if you, have you, have you guys heard of XGBoost? Okay, so XGBoost is, um, <clears throat> I guess, a extreme gradient boosting. It's, it's basically a boosting model that takes in, uh, I think, some, I don't know, gradient uh, applications as well. But, um, but it, it has very good performance. Um, and so uh, it, it's worth talking about uh, boosting a little bit. And, uh, and boosting is um, kind of like random forest uh, with, a, with a couple exceptions here, okay? So in random forest, you produce a whole bunch of these trees, and then you put your prediction through all of the trees, and you take the average on all of them. Uh, with boosting, you kind of do a, a sequential, uh, I guess, a sequential series of trees, and each of these trees are they're they're called stumps because uh, you have just one split. Okay, so you don't really build out a tree; you just get kind of two branches, and you kind of split your data into like you know left and right. Um, and, and these, uh, these m tiny, tiny miniature trees or these stumps are fit on the residuals of the data. So you kind of start off um, predicting the mean for everybody. And uh, you know, you've got different amounts of error. Some are like positive residuals and some are negative residuals. And then you basically create a, a split and you get you know, one prediction for this side and one prediction for the other side. And then after you fit that, then you get another set of residuals, and then you do another split and things like that. Um, the other kind of key aspect of boosting is that you pick something called the learning rate. And this forces the, the model to be what we call a slow learner, a slow learner, okay? Um, in that um, 
we are going to only make tiny little adjustments, okay? So, um, it's kind of, uh, uh, I guess I use the, I'll use the hot and cold shower analogy. I think I used this uh, <laughs> earlier in, in the thing, but basically, um, <clears throat> if you just fit the residuals, it's going to say, um, you know, if X is over three and a half, you know, um, add two, or uh, and if it's less than subtract two or something like that. Um, and if you do that, then you might have swung a little bit too far and you have to kind of swing back. So it's, a, you know, like in when adjusting the temperature in the shower, if, uh, if it feels too cold, you might crank the heat all the way to the right and then now it gets too hot and then you have to crank it back to the left and you have to kind of do this back and forth adjusting until you get it right, okay? Uh, slow learner, on the other hand, says, oh, it's too cold. So we need to make it hotter, but um, it takes a much slower approach in that like it just ever so slightly taps the heat uh, on. So it just gets just a touch warmer, okay? And you say, well, we're still too cold. And so you just tap it again and it gets just a touch warmer and it's still too cold. And so it takes a lot longer to finally kind of adjust the temperature. But when, when it finally reaches it, the right temperature, then it feels like it's the right temperature here. Okay, so um, so in this case, we will uh, we will try boosting again, and I'm going to kind of <laughs> manually illustrate, manually do the boosting calculations. We'll use um, a learning rate of 0.3, a lambda of 0.3. Now, normally, this learning rate is like one percent, 0.01, or something really small. Okay, but just to kind of that would be like frustratingly small if uh, in this manual example. So I'm going to do like 30%, but you'll still get get the idea of it. And uh, and then again, the final predictions is you kind of fit each of these little decision trees, and you keep just adding on um, uh, this kind of sequence of decision trees. Okay. <clears throat> so. Um, my original data is one, two, three, four, five for X and Y is one, one, three, seven, eight. Um, first, I'm gonna predict the mean for everybody. And so my residuals, if, uh, if my mean is four, my residuals are negative three, negative three, negative one, three, and four. And then um, basically I'm still gonna do a split at three and a half. And if I uh, split it at three and a half, then my adjustment, is going to be negative 2.33 for the values less than three three and a half because we're fitting the residuals and plus 3.5 for um, the values above to fit those residuals okay however um, when I uh, use the boosted tree rather than predicting 4 minus 2.33 okay which is normally what I would get right so um, in our regular tree, we would say if it's less than 3.5, you're gonna. Our current prediction is four. We should subtract off uh, 2.33, and if it's greater than 3.5, we would add three and a half. So um, uh, I would have, pre have predicted 1.67 or 7.5 here um, if I added these residuals directly. But instead, I multiply my adjustment by the learning rate of say 30 percent. Okay. So when I'm above, if I have x equal to 4, normally I would have done 4 plus 3.5 and, and I would have predicted 7.5. But here, because of my learning rate of 30%, I only add 30% to 3.5, okay? And so this adjusts my prediction from 4 to 5.05, okay? And if I'm below 3.5, it adjusts my prediction from 4 down to 3.3, okay? And these are not good predictions, right? Because the true value, I mean, the average of of the y's over here is, you know, 1.67 and the average over here is 7.5. And, and I'm not close to that. I'm at 5.05 and 3.3. .3. These are these are poor predictions right now, okay? Um, but I'm not done because I've only fit kind of one in the sequence. 
and nor probably in a real kind of boosted tree scenario, I would have like a, a sequence of a hundred of these trees or a thousand trees. So the next part is I recalculate my residuals. My residuals are now negative 2.3, negative 2.3, negative 0.3, 1.95, and 2.95. And I say, all right, let's take a look at these residuals and fit a tree to this, okay? So looking at this, I'm probably still gonna draw a split between x is three and four. Um, and if x is three or lower, um, what I need to do is, uh, what's the average of 2.3, 2.3, and negative 0.3, I don't know. Um, so I'm gonna try to fit these values and it says, the residual there is negative 1.63, and then if x is greater than, is four or higher, greater than three and a half, then it's gonna predict, uh, you know, the residual here is halfway between 1.95 and 2.95, it's gonna say 2.45. Um, so my new prediction here is I take 3.3 plus only 30% of what it says I should adjust, and so that brings my new prediction down to 2.81 or 5.7 uh, up up to 5.75. So this is still <laughs> these are not good predictions, um, but I get a new set of residuals, and uh, we will do this. Uh, take a look at this one. Okay, so looking at this set of residuals, however, um, looking at my residual being negative 1.81 and 0.019 and 1.215, the split here happens now between two and three, okay? So rather than just kind of reproducing the same thing, it says, hey, if these are your residuals, make a split between two and three. And so when you make the split between two and three, it says if you're less than two and a half, you know, the amount you should adjust should be negative 1.8, and if you're greater than two and a half, the amount you should adjust will be uh, 1.2 or something like that, okay? And then when you plug that in, now uh, our predicted values are 2.267, 3.172, and 6.147. So these are still kind of very poor predictions, but you start to see now we get three unique values, okay? And if we kind of continue this, we will end up getting kind of, eventually we will get closer to the true values and um, you know, our, our residuals will get, um, you know, we'll have even more unique values uh, as, as necessary, okay? And so you, uh, so this is kind of a sequence, um, you end up getting a, a whole bunch of, the sequence of poor performing trees um, and, e and at each one, you just make a slight adjustment, okay? Uh, and that's kind of the, the idea of boosting, is um, uh, it's, it's a, a sequence of trees with, uh, with small adjustments at each one. And so, you know, each, each observation kind of goes through a whole bunch of very similar trees, um, and you just kind of make little adjustments at each of them. And so, um, you know, if we were to do this with R, you can actually, there is a package called GBM, and that, that performs boosting with trees. And so I could, if I specify the same uh, settings that we used, okay, make three trees and use a shrinkage factor of 0.3, then it will end up producing the same results that we, we, we had, okay? Now, of course, um, you shouldn't use these settings your number of trees should be something like 500 or 1,000 or something like that, and your shrinkage should probably be like 1% something, or you could just use the, the default things. But you could see that after I fit my boosted model and I say, hey, let's make a prediction for x equal to 1, it predicts 2.267. And it's a, if I say, hey, make a prediction for when x is 3, it predicts 3.172, uh, which is right here, and then for 4, it predicts 6.147. So, so we can kind of reverse engineer and backwards solve and figure out, like, okay, this is where these numbers are coming from. 
um, as far as uh, how this boosted tree works, okay? Which, um, as far as, you know, for me personally, when I learned like a machine learning model, I always kind of want to know like, how did it end up at this number at the end? Um, rather than, because uh, a lot of times when you just see it like this, it just feels like a black box. Like some, like it's a mystery, something comes in and it does something mysteriously and it spits something out. So if, if I'm able to say, oh, it got 2.667 or 2.267 and I'm able to get 2.267 and trace back like how I ended up there, like I always feel like, okay, I kind of understand a little bit. And then if I just repeated this process to be more complicated or bigger, then we get whatever the, um, the machine is producing. So, um, so that is kind of boosting for boosted trees. And, uh, and boosted trees get uh, generally have pretty high performance. Um, they, they often perform very well in kind of cross-validation settings. And, uh, and they are a very kind of popular model choice for, um, I would say, numeric prediction. And they still are. So um, probably if you look at like a Kaggle competition, um, uh, probably a lot of these winning models are going to be uh, either neural networks um, or uh, some kind of boosted boosted tree algorithm, and uh, and then or an ensemble, kind of a blend of these multiple of these models and stuff. Okay, uh, this is just kind of like the graph of the predictions, which isn't which isn't uh, very useful here. Okay. Uh, all right, this is my last slide <laughs> that just says thanks for a great quarter. Um, so I guess this will end the kind of formal part of our lecture. And um, uh, I don't know. I'll, I will, uh, I'm happy to just have a little, I guess, fireside chat or whatever um, at the end of the quarter. But, um, but yes, thank you. Um, I do have a favor to ask, and that is... Um, if you haven't filled out your course evaluation, um, I, I appreciate you taking the time to do so. I think the deadline is like tomorrow at 8 a.m. or something. I think this is the, the last moment. So actually, let me see how many of you have filled out. <laughs> I don't know who, but it will tell me like seven people filled it out. Um, <laughs> but let's see. Do, 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 do. I'm curious. Okay, 102B, 16 people have filled it out, 19%. Okay, so, oh, that's that's not really great. Um, <laughs> all right, but uh, but uh, yeah, if I should have been pushing this a little bit higher, so I'm a little bit late in the game. But yes, if you take the time to fill out your uh, course evaluation, that is much appreciated. Um, they it always gets reviewed during kind of like the merit reviews and things like that. So um, that's much appreciated. Thank you. Um, and yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks for a great quarter. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, watching uh, the video online if you're watching. Um, and good luck as you study the, for the final. Congratulations to those of you who are graduating. And um, yeah, enjoy your summer. Enjoy the rest of your life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, I guess I'll stop the recording here.